Okay, everyone, just before David starts, I would just like to thank you all. David's talk is Net Zero and the Shipping Challenge. Um, David is a longtime personal friend of mine and a native of Westmeath. He was educated at St. Joseph's School in Rochford Bridge, Athlone Technical University, Shannon, and the Royal Society of Chemistry in London, where he has a diploma in analytical chemistry and a first class honours degree in chemistry. During his early career, David worked in the UK for ICI and DuPont, working as a technical chemist, specialising in troubleshooting areas in the automotive industry for DuPont. In 1997, David moved from, to Castrol, Ireland, where he's held a variety of roles, including technical, sales, business development, strategic project and sales management. In his current role of global sales director, he manages the, the distributor business in the Castrol Global Marine and Energy Division. Um, David looks after four regional teams in the Asia Pacific, Middle East, India, Europe and Africa and the Americas. David naturally has to travel a lot for his job at Castrol. And when he's not doing that, he's at home in Ireland, either playing golf or looking after his family. So I'm going to hand over to David and I hope you enjoy his talk. David, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Tony. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure to get this opportunity to present to you. Um, hopefully you'll find the, the topic uh, interesting. It's a little bit of a departure, I, I'd imagine, from some of your normal subjects, but hopefully you'll find it has relevance to a lot of what we hear and see in the news today and um, pertinent to a lot of our daily lives as well. So please, Put any questions you have into the Q&A and I'll endeavour to do my best to answer those at the, at the end. Um, so without further ado, I will kick off. I think we all are very familiar with the challenge that society um, and the world is facing around trying to reduce carbon emissions, which is obviously linked to climate change and linked to global warming. Um, the scale and impact of these changes are something we read and hear about every day. It touches every part of our personal lives and it touches every part of our working lives as well, because almost every entity in the world today is trying to find a way to reduce their carbon footprint, reduce their emissions if they are uh, contributing emissions to the climate. So what this slide shows you is kind of that holistic global picture of how all those th these things are interconnected and what the various impacts are and potential solutions available to mitigate a lot of these serious challenges we're facing. So, you know, from the societal impacts that we, we see in our everyday lives in terms of what we've been asked to do in our personal lives, uh, what we're trying to do in terms of the biodiversity, um, the reforestation, you know, how, how we deal with food, what we consume. Um, obviously, a key part of this is mobility. Uh, in terms of how we move about um, and how mobility needs to change. Um, so the electrification um, agenda, what that means for us as a society, what it means for the infrastructure to support that, and what it means also as well in terms of um, how the transport networks need to change and the types of vehicles or infrastructure to, to support that. Um, and of course, key to all of this is uh, the production of electricity. Um, and we all are pretty familiar with how that's produced today, and I'll touch on that as I go through some of the slides as well, because it is very relevant. Um, so production of electricity and the transition from, you know, being fossil fuel dependent, as, as most economies are today, from uh, to one that's more uh, focused on renewables and emission-free solutions, and how all this knits together, and ultimately how we're going to all collectively uh, do what we have to do to achieve a, a net zero solution. I think what we all realize is that, you know, the dates and timing of this is getting more and more compressed, um, that we don't have the luxury as a, as a society to hang around for much longer with these solutions. A lot of these are in train. The question is the pace of that change and what the impact is and how governments, uh, companies, societies um, can deliver on the expectation of what needs to be done. So this gives a, a flavor for all of these things knit together. Uh, and the impact on the interdependencies. So I think we all realize uh, the scale of the challenge it is, it is, it is very significant, um, something that, you know, poses um, a lot of challenges in terms of the delivery um, of the various components that need to happen 
Um, this evening, I'm going to talk specifically about the shipping aspect, which um, people are not probably overly familiar with because it's quite a specialised industry. We are a, an island, we are a maritime nation, but we're a small maritime nation. But nonetheless, um, it will have an impact on us, but there is a wider global impact, and that's what I'm going to talk about this evening. But I think on the left-hand side, what you can see here is that, that shipping plays a part in all of this. I'll touch on the, the scale of, of the shipping contribution to emissions today, how that stacks up versus the bigger picture, um, and what shipping needs to do to transition to a net zero future. And the, the challenges in shipping are quite different to what we might see elsewhere. Um, they're not any greater or any less because every every part of uh, you know that that circle that I talked about in the previous slide has its own challenges. Um, but from a shipping perspective, that journey has already started. Uh, it's a question now of the pace at which it can be delivered. Um, and also as well, what's really important in all of this is um, how we generate our energy. Um, and when you look on the left-hand side, what you can see is the, the footprint of how energy is produced today and the impact of the various sources of energy production um, and where we need to get to in 2050. And 2050 is probably even, even a little bit too late. Um, what you can see here is that the dependence on fossil fuels obviously needs to decrease and there'll be the introduction of newer types of fuels uh, that will be needed and energy sources to, to meet our requirements, which of course are growing as well. And then also over here, what you can see is by sector, the contribution to that. And you can see that some sectors have obviously a more material impact than others. And the pace at which the change can happen will be very dependent on those larger sectors moving and moving at pace. Interesting, when you look at one of the bigger ones, it's buildings and heating, um, which is a very diverse one to tackle because it's not one single part of the economy that we're talking about here. So that very much is down to governments, government legislation, mindset, and the ability of company and individuals to buy into what needs to happen in order for that transition to happen as well. So quite a lot of um, big chunky areas that need to be tackled. Obviously, industry is a big sector, and there's a distinction here between heavy industry and other industries. I think when we talk about heavy industry, we're talking about things like steel manufacture, which are using vast amounts of energy. The other industries obviously encompasses everything. Uh, you have surface transport, um, and then you have shipping and air transport. So a lot of uh, various industries that have, as I mentioned, different challenges to address and how they can contribute to finding the solutions that are needed. What I want to touch upon here is just when we talk about shipping, what exactly are we talking about? Now does that fit into the wider energy picture? Because uh, the marine industry is not just vessels, it's many other things, and we also have to include in that a view around what we would consider the energy sector or the oil and gas sector as it may be better known. So when we talk about marine, you can kind of break it into two distinct buckets. Uh, you can talk about the international marine business, which is a global business with large global players operating in this space, operating very large fleets, which trade internationally. The vessel types are quite important because I'll come to it a little bit later on, the, the nature of, of, of these vessels, the size of the vessels, how they're powered, and the proportion of those vessels in the world fleet are important. So in terms of the scale of how the problem has to be tackled, there are particular vessel types which come to the top of the queue. So what you've got here is you've got a mixture of, of vessel types. Some of you are probably familiar with, others may not be, but just for clarity, I think it's important that, you know, because you'll see references to some of these later on. So you've got tankers um, up here on the left-hand side and crude and chemicals. So that's anything from crude oil to what we would call petrochemical products or finished products, so that could be gasoline, diesel, um, LNG, and so on. Um, cargo vessels, which literally can carry anything um, in terms of dry cargoes. Bulkers, um, cruise vessels and offshore support vessels. Containers, uh, which is a huge sector and growing and LNG and LPG, and this is a really important sector. And I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit later on as well. And it's something that we, we've heard a lot about this week, particularly in our own news. Then from a domestic marine perspective, you've got fishing, ferries, dredgers, and tugboats. Now, these sectors vary in size, depending on the particular country in question. We have, for the size of our coastline, a relatively small fishing fleet, 
but nonetheless, some of the vessels are quite large and kind of similar in size to this particular one here. So anyone, if you go to clay bags, you'll see very large fishing vessels there. Um, and those vessels, you know, are, are considerably large and you might see in other parts of the world in terms of the, the, the size of them and, and the nature of the fishing they do. So that gives you a flavor for what, when we talk about marine, that's the, the footprint of the sort of vessels involved. When we talk about energy, it's a, it's a complex sector. Um, with lots of different kit involved in the production of oil and gas offshore. So you've got drilling, um, rigs of various shapes and sizes. You've got floating production. You've got subsea production. So, for example, the current gas field is, is subsea production. So there are no rigs. There is no topside facility, as we, we would call it, off the current field. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the waters are quite deep there. So, um, and the Atlantic off the coast of Ireland, the weather is quite bad. So pulling a topside facility out there is quite challenging. So in, in those examples, what they do is they put infrastructure on the seabed, which is then linked to the shore. Uh, these things are known as Christmas tree structures. Um, they can be, you know, 30, 40 meters high. So to give you an example of scale, uh, deep water drilling, there's a deep water drilling ship. You've got fixed production platforms, which are, um, things you would see typically in places like the North Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caspian Sea, and the, the Bulk, Brazil. And then you have subsea processing also. So while you also have capture of oil and gas happening on the sea floor, you also do get some processing on uh, sub, subsea as well. And then onshore, there's obviously a very large land-based drilling business. Um, and it varies in type around the world. So in, in the Middle East, you've got the more traditional um, land-based drilling. The oil is quite rich in content, uh, close to the surface, uh, compared to what you see happening, say, in North America and Canada, where you've got shale oil, you've got fracking. Um, so quite a complex industry as well. And then, obviously, you've got what we call midstream, which is how you transport all those products from the source of which they're um, drilled, um, either um, at sea or on shore, and then put into the network and tra translates into finished goods, be it diesel, uh, get natural gas, and so on. And then a, a subset of all of that is power generation, which is a really important sector. Um, I'm going to touch on power generation because even though the topic of the conversation today is around shipping, I think power generation um, is an important element to think of this because there are links here to the fuel type. So when we talk about power generation, what do we mean? And it is a re very relevant topic uh, today because you hear a lot about energy security, um, the interdependency of countries on one another, be it through interconnectors or through it, uh, gas pipelines and so on. So nuclear, um, which is which is obvious and is an industry that's been around for quite a while. It was an industry that was one that was had a lot of bad press, but actually in some countries is a very mature, well-run industry and has benefits in terms of how we manage the climate agenda because nuclear doesn't create any emissions, though it does create obviously hazardous waste, which has a whole different set of criteria to deal with that. So places like France and Sweden have very mature nuclear industry and very safe nuclear industries. Coal fire we're all familiar with, and this is one where the it's a, it's a serious bone of contention these days because there are a lot of big economies dependent on coal-fired power generation, uh, India and China being the best examples of that. We do have one coal-fired plant here. Um, I think it's only working to about a quarter of its capacity, which is money point. Then you've got um, HFO, which stands for heavy fuel oil. And heavy fuel oil uh, is a uh, residual byproduct of the refining process is typically the fuel oil that would have been used in, in ships, trains, so large engines that would be able to burn this type of fuel, um, quite viscous, high in sulfur content. But in, in a lot of parts of the world, this is still used for power generation um, in the Middle East, for example, and also in some islands, because some islands are dependent on this type of power generation. You see a lot of this in the Caribbean as an example. So they can use heavy fuel oil, they can use diesel, they can use LNG, or in some cases they can use a mixture of. And the engine types can be two-stroke, four-stroke or gas turbines. Um, we see this type of power generation in this country. Uh, a good example is the peak capacity plant at Road, which is using gas turbines um, operating off um, 
uh, dual fuel, they can run off uh, gas or diesel, typically diesel when they're peaking capacity, uh, which is a very expensive way of producing electricity, but sometimes, you know, a quick way of doing it in an emergency. Wind, uh, we all are very familiar with, and you've got offshore and onshore. Um, that's an industry that's expanding rapidly. The technology is changing. Uh, the latest turbines can generate up to five megawatts, and they are enormous. Um, the largest ones are obviously being developed for mainly offshore, uh, and they are getting smarter about how they can operate some of those in much deeper waters, which is going to be critical for us in particular if we want to be able to maximize our um, offshore wind potential, which, which is huge. Um, then we have combined cycle gas turbines. Um, good examples of these are places like Dublin Bay Power, Huntstown. So that's using a gas turbine, a steam turbine in, uh, in, in sync with one another um, and quite a common and um, universally used form of um, power generation. Hydro speaks for itself. Um, Arden Crusher being our biggest example of a hydro station here. Solar, um, this is obviously huge in countries that have um, the ability to produce lots of power um, through solar panels and, and, and solar arrays like you see there. And then the final area is uh, CHP, which is combined heat and power, which you'll often see in production facilities. Uh, Guinness, for example, have a combined heat and power plant with some gas engines there, and they're there to produce electricity and produce steam, which is used in the manufacturing process. Um, Cogen, biogas, and landfill are all classifications of smaller scale power generation, but still uh, examples um, exist here as well. And we do see in some of our landfill sites, there are some power generation um, units operating off those. Don't sink is, is one example. Um, typically engines between two to five meg megawatt in size. So when we talk about marine engines and we talk about that there, there are two main types, there are two stroke and four stroke. And I uh, just thought it was important to give an idea on when we talk about a two stroke engine in a marine environment, it's very different to two strokes as we're all familiar with, but you know, on, on motorbikes, lawnmowers, outboard engines, and so on. These are enormous pieces of machinery. Um, you can see on the right-hand side here, an example of a crankcase from a two-stroke engine. So that just gives you a, a scale of, of, of one of these engines. These pistons here also are, are enormous, and over, over time, these engines have got bigger. Um, why is that? Ships have got bigger. Uh, and the power required to propel these ships um, has increased. Uh, the biggest of these engines now, the largest ones are producing in excess of 82,000 kilowatts of power. So, you know, they're huge. These pistons will have a travel under stroke, but measured in meters. Um, and the bores will go up to almost a meter on, on, the, uh, on the larger ones. So very big pieces of case, different types. So I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit in terms of the the fuel and the impact on how you move these engines from being fueled with predominantly hydrocarbons as they are today to um, alternatives. Then we also uh, talk about four-stroke engines and four-stroke engines come in different shapes and sizes. Um, what you're seeing here on the top left is a, is a large marine four-stroke engine. This is something akin to what you might see in a ferry cruise ship. Um, they're engines that are obviously very powerful and um, they're smaller, so they're perfect for vessels where space is a premium. So like a cruise ship or a ferry, uh, you would see multiples of them. Large cruise ships may have eight of these. A, a ferry would typically have four. So the Ulysses, for example, will have four large engines of this type. Um, different, as I say, shapes and sizes. Um, Huge power output from some, and particularly those used in, in military vessels because they're required to go from idling to high power, you know, very quickly. So you have to produce a lot of power very fast, but obviously consume a huge amount of fuel. And then they're also used in power generation. And you see in this particular case, lots of them working in, in parallel. Uh, and you see this where fuel is in abundance um, and is cheaper. So places like the Middle East, the Americas. Um, trying to run a, a facility like this in our part of the world would be an extremely costly exercise. You don't tend to see power generation of this type in our part of the world. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of some of the um, ship types, uh, the power generation aspect of the bigger picture, because that has a linkage to fuels. 
and obviously some of the engine types um, involved in the industry that we're talking about this evening. So global shipping and its relevance. So what role does global shipping play today and, and what's the scale of that? So a few important facts to touch upon here. 90% of world trade moves on the water. So that's a, that's a mind boggling number. When you think about everything we use today, 90% of that has been moved on a vessel at some um, point in time or the, or the components to manufacture it have been moved. So the, the world shipping industry is crucial to the world's economy. I think you only have to look back at the example in the Suez Canal when the ship got wedged as to how disruptive that can be um, in terms of its impact you know, for one vessel. Um, and these vessels, you know, the latest container vessels, the biggest ones are now carrying 23,000 TEUs. A TEU is a standard 20-foot container, so that gives you an idea of the size of some of these newer vessels. There are more than 50,000 vessels operating today, and I showed you the different types. Um, so moving every sort of a cargo, um, you know, can be pretty much moved, moved on the water. Um, it is growing. It's been growing 4% year on year. So the world's fleet has actually been shrinking, but the amount of trade has been growing because the vessel sizes have been getting bigger. Vessels have been getting more efficient. Port operations have been getting more efficient. So the ability to turn vessels around is increasing. So all of that adds to the efficiency of how all of this hangs together. And from the perspective of global greenhouse gases, uh, the world's shipping, um, footprint is about two to three percent of the global greenhouse gas footprint and that's comparable to Germany to give you a, an idea of scale. Uh, there's some numbers there the size will be shared and people can look at that it just gives you some flavor to the scale of some particular parts of the shipping industry uh, how much uh, product is moved, what types of product are moved and how that's growing. And pretty much you can see that uh, all these areas are, are showing uh, upward trends. So obviously that represents a considerable challenge in terms of how you migrate to a net zero outcome and the pace at which you can do that. So just a, a few useful pieces of information just to touch upon here. So the the timeline you see here on the bottom left hand side is to give an idea of some of the key events that have happened, are happening or are going to happen in relation to the journey that needs to uh, occur in order for shipping to make that transition. So you'll see reference there just things like Davos and, and the sort of economic summits that happen because ultimately one of the key enablers to all of this is the legislation that drives it. And shipping like many other industries acts upon what the legislation commits it to do. And unfortunately, it's more stick than carrot um, and is the case with a lot of industries. So the legislation drives behaviors, it drives what happens in the industry. So shipping because it's a global business requires a lot of governments to get together and come up with a, a consistent way in which they manage this. There are international shipping organizations. So the IMO is the, is the largest governing body, that's the International Maritime Organization. It's their purpose to set policy about how ships operate, uh, both in terms of the health and safety aspect, ship operations, but also in terms of the impact of vessels on the environment and how they operate and work, not only from a nation's perspective, but also from a waste perspective and so on. So it's a very complex area with a lot of legislation. Legislation has become more, more binding over time uh, because vessel operations have become more complex. But you can see here some of the timings that um, are involved in, the, in that transition. So the IMO and others play a huge role in, in, in this. And I'll, I'll touch upon what needs to happen from a fuels perspective in order for this journey um, to be feasible. The, the graph here on the left-hand side shows you, if you were to take the existing world's fleet and you were to transition it to uh, the solutions around newer fuels, uh, and those solutions are kind of well known. It's a case of, of deploying them, but it's a mixture of building new ships and retrofitting the existing fleet. And there are a few things that were really um, critical to this. So building new ships is an activity that's cost intensive, uh, capital intensive. Uh, new ships are extremely expensive entities to build. 
you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. I think some of the newest cruise ships are in excess of a billion dollars, but they're not moving cargo, obviously. They're, they exist for a different reason, but the, the largest new container ships, you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. So companies investing in, in new vessels require a lot of capital investment. And that had fallen back in recent years because the credit crunch had impacted that. And a lot of people have got, have got burned in investing in shipping. Um, so it, it, it had died off a little bit at the, compared to the levels, but the fleet has constantly got to be renewed. And the pace at which you can manage to transition to net zero really is going to be driven by the pace at which you can retrofit or build new vessels. The majority of shipyards are sitting in the Far East. The shipyard industry in the Western Hemisphere has been in decline for a long time. There are shipyards um, in Europe, but they tend to be smaller. Um, more specialized in what they do. So the majority of large scale shipbuilding is happening in places like uh, South Korea, Japan, and China. And then also from the perspective of the amount of CO2 that the industry is emitting today, if nothing was to be done, this is the trajectory of the emissions. So you can see that's pretty severe and, and, and you know a very negative outcome in terms of climate change. Um, the purple line here is demonstrating what a 50% reduction, which was what the industry was signing up to with the Paris Agreement, uh, COP26 and so on. But actually the pace at which the change needs to happen is, is probably faster than that and is the blue line. So you can see that this has implications for this and has implications for the pace at which this happens. So all these things are interdependent um, and it is a complex jigsaw. So drilling into some specifics around this. So at the Paris Agreement, the intention was that there would be a 40% reduction in gas emissions, greenhouse gas emissions by the shipping industry. 24% um, um, of those um, reductions um, were going to be achieved by using LNG. Um, and LNG is a really interesting part of the conversation, as it is not only with shipping, but in the wider power generation, energy conversation. Because LNG, while it's a fossil fuel, is a transition fuel, because it's impossible to move from a purely hydrocarbon uh, driven um, industry in terms of you know, an energy source to a renewable one. There's a lot of things have to happen in order for that transition to happen. And LNG plays a role in this because it's the least polluting of the hydrocarbon fuels. It's readily available. Um, it has a good calorific value, so it produces a lot of energy. And there's a well-tried and tested industry there to support it. Uh, the question uh, around LNG is that from a purely um, ethical climate perspective, it's not a green fuel. Uh, and you know, the use of it can sometimes be considered greenwashing. Um, and also, there is the geopolitical aspect of LNG, because a lot of the LNG is sitting in places where, unfortunately, the people in control of it are not necessarily playing by the rules these days, and that's a well documented. We all know that in terms of uh, the Ukraine war, and what Russia is doing with LNG, and, and the LNG that's been supplied into Europe through the various pipelines. What the graphs at the bottom are, are demonstrating is the mixture of fuels that are required to make this transition and, and the percentage of those that are expected to be used and also a distinction between two and four stroke which i touched upon earlier so you can see there's quite a mixture of fuels involved here so it's not a one hat fits all scenario by any stretch there are many reasons for that um, it would be impossible to switch from hydrocarbons over to another fuel type um, a single solution because the scale of the quantities involved is so vast that it's just not feasible to do that. Also, if you look at some of the fuel types here to produce them in the quantities and have them in the locations where they're needed in those quantities would be nigh on impossible. So you've got here a mixture of hydrogen, you have the various biofuel types, you have pure electric, um, and that does exist in the shipping world, um, battery driven vessels, you've got ammonia, which is one of the key fuels that's been looked at, methanol, LPG, uh, which is different to LNG, then you've got LNG, synthetic and natural gas, biogas. Uh, these are hydrocarbon fuels, so you have marine gas oil, ultra low sulfur fuel oil, and very low sulfur fuel oil. 
and then you've got heavy fuel oil, which I touched on earlier, and you'll see plus scrubber. Uh, so what does that mean? So there are a number of vessels that are allowed to use heavy fuel oil and continue to do so today. And heavy fuel oil is differentiated by the sulfur content. So typical heavy fuel oil sulfur content is around 3%. The fuel that um, most vessels are, are looking to use today uh, and the legislation in 2020 changed, which made it mandatory to use this unless you've got a scrubber. I'll come back to what a scrubber is. Is 0.5% sulfur. So unless you've got a scrub on your vessel, you've got to use a low sulfur, what's considered a low sulfur fuel. And that's a, not a low sulfur fuel as we would understand it from a land-based perspective, because typically the diesel you're putting into your car is 0.01% or lower. But from a marine perspective, that's considered low sulfur. Vessels that burn heavy fuel oil, they use a scrubber, uh, can do so. The scrubber, in essence, is a, a form of a catalytic converter, which is a, removing the nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide that's going up the, the stack. Uh, capturing that um, and avoiding it being emitted into the atmosphere so that, the, that vessel, its emissions are, are within the required levels. Um, the science behind this is well developed. The engineering behind it is. The question is retrofitting vessels, the pace at which that can happen, building new vessels with this technology. It is big kit. It does impact the center of gravity of a vessel and it requires a lot of engineering skills to run them. It still creates waste uh, and that waste is emitted uh, or collected uh, in a different way, in a liquid form, which has created its own problems. Um, but it is a solution uh, to the transition. And you can see the mix there on the grass between before 2035 and after 25, you'll see some changes in the fuel types um, as time goes on. So from the perspective of um, the future impacts of vessel type and fuel type, uh, if you remember on a, an earlier slide, I talked about the different vessel types and the relevance is that is you'll see it referenced here. So if you look at this graph, you'll see that the vast majority of the, of the tonnage, not necessarily the number of vessels because the tonnage is based on the size of vessels. So the larger vessels obviously dominate. So you've got container ships, dry bulk ships, ore carriers, uh, that sort of vessel and tankers dominate the global shipping fleet in terms of tonnage. So the ability to transition these vessels onto um, zero emission fuels is going to be critical to the pace at which this journey happens. Um, and there you can see the kind of projected trajectory of that change. What you've got on the right hand side is the fuels landscape linked to that. So what you see here in the blue, um, the orange and the green is today's picture. The blue being liquid fuel, be it low sulfur uh, or heavy fuel oil. Um, marine diesel oil, which a lot of vessels are burning as well, or, or, or diesel as we would know it, is slightly different, but in essence similar. Um, a lot of vessels burning that. Um, prior to the 2020 change in the global legislation, there were various what we call EK areas. There were emission control areas where you were only allowed to burn this type of fuel, which was a way of policing emissions through that. So a lot of vessels transitioned onto this type of fuel. Um, so a lot of vessels trading in the Irish Sea, the English Channel, the North Sea, the Baltic Sea would have, would have transitioned to this fuel while they're operating in, in those waters consistently. And then you'll see LNG being quite a small green line. Um, if you remember earlier, I, I mentioned LNG is an important transition fuel. LNG has been around for about 25, 30 years as a, as a viable fuel for the shipping industry, but it's never really taken off in the way that it probably should have. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. These fuels are always cheaper, readily available, and with no legislation pushed to change from them, people were not going to spend more money burning LNG. It's a more difficult fuel to handle. So it presents uh, challenges around how you stock and store it in a ship, uh, where you can bunker it and so on. So it's, it's never really taken off. The question is, does this green line remain like it is, or does it become bigger? And that's back to that transition period and the pace at which it happens. Then what you can see here is scalable zero emission fuels. I think the important point there is scalable. Uh, the scale at which these fuels can be made available is absolutely critical. Um, because these ships burn very large quantities of fuel, so they need to have access to large sources of fuel, large volume. It's a fuel they'll bunker at a given time. We're talking about hundreds of tons in, a, in one delivery. Um, so the question is, the infrastructure exists to produce it, 
to deliver it and manage it on shore and get it onto vessels. So the future fuels and, and the types of those fuels, and this is to touch upon um, the nuances of each of these fuels. Um, ammonia, um, who most people would be familiar with and would say, well, that doesn't sound like a very viable fuel. It is actually, it is actually quite a good fuel to use, uh, but it is a hazardous chemical. So um, while it represents a potential source of fuel that we the world has got to figure a way to kind of manufacture it store it manage it in, in a in a way that's safe um, and also modify the engine so there's a lot of work being done on those large two-stroke engines to make sure that they can burn different types of fuel so already in trial our engines using ammonia and similarly with methanol um, and the intention is to see how valid it is to power a large vessel with these fuels uh, one factor in, in the transition from one fuel to another is the calorific value of the fuel. So it's not just a case of switching out one litre for another litre of a fuel, because depending on its calorific value, you may have to carry more or less of it. Typically with these other ones compared to hydrocarbons, you'd have to carry a lot more. So the question is, are the tanks on board of vessels sufficient in size to cope with that based on their routes or do their trading or bunkering behaviours need to change to facilitate the movement to a different fuel and that has significance in terms of the footprint of where vessels trade and operate the footprint of the key hubs today is that what the footprint needs to be in the future so to give you an example 40 percent of the world's shipping transits through singapore and bunkers in singapore so it gives you an idea of the scale of of the operations in in, in singapore alone so biofuels are another um, example of a, of a fuel source that is potentially available of course biofuels are either produced organically or synthetically um, the shipping industry will be competing with the land-based industry for these fuels and that's another factor in all of this because shipping is one um, part of the equation so there are a lot of other um, users of, of fuels today that need to transition to other fuels so the question is how do you strike a balance between all those end user needs liquid hydrogen uh, has potential uh, but only in short sea operations, as I mentioned there, because it's got low volumetic, volumetric energy densities. So that really is the point I made, that you can't carry as much of it to do longer trips, but it, it would work as a solution for shorter trips. Uh, ferries, for example. Um, and then there's the hybridization, um, you know, so how you can kind of look for other efficiencies in terms of how the energy is used on board a vessel and how you can maximize that from an efficiency perspective. So a lot of work going into bulk design and the efficiency of vessels, the power output. Uh, one of the industry's response to increased fuel prices um, about 10 years ago when fuel prices uh, in the shipping world uh, increased enormously was something called slow steaming. A bit like, you know, when you hear people talk about slowing down the speed of traffic on waterways, similarly with shipping, what people did was just slow the, down the ships, which reduced the fuel consumption enormously. But those have a knock-on effect in that the time taken to get from A to B takes longer. So you need more vessels to move the same amount of cargo at the pace and it would be needed. So I remember once hearing a, a, how true it is that IKEA at any given time would have had seven container ships on the water moving product uh, from China to Europe. Um, obviously, if you slow down vessels, you then have to put more vessels on the water because you still have to get your product to market at the same pace you were doing previously. So all of these things have a knock-on effect. Um, internal combustion engines remain dominant um, in the shipping world. So while the land-based transportation solution has a lot of emphasis on electrification, that's not so readily adaptable within the shipping world because of the size of the engines, the amount of power needed. So other solutions will need to be found. Um, it wouldn't be possible to generate an, an electric motor uh, uh, being you know, fueled from you know, electrical generation on board the vessel or through battery storage that move these large vessels. Uh, there is electrification happening. You see it happening in smaller ferries. Norway are very good at this but Norway has a lot of readily available electricity because most of their electricity is produced through hydro. So for them, it's it's a cheaper fuel. So electrification in Norway, and that's why they don't take on electric cars, is considerably higher than anywhere else. 
And then also you want fuel flexibility. So it's not guaranteed you'll get every one of these fuels in every location you're going to. So engines are going to be designed and are being designed to be dual fuel or tri fueled So they'll be able to burn um, LNG, um, a liquid fuel, be it, you know, methanol, ammonia. So, uh, and, and potentially as a backup, um, a heavy fuel oil. Um, so a mixture of all those scenarios, um, potentially. What you see on the right hand side here is how these things are going to be produced. Um, what we're seeing here in the top is, is um, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen. So green hydrogen being the electrolysis of water, producing hydrogen, um, blue hydrogen coming out of um, natural gas um, and, and breaking that down through chemical reactions. You also see reference here to carbon storage, which is another key area um, around the energy transition that needs to happen. Uh, I won't go into all of this, but in essence, it's the chemistry and the petrochemical industry requirements in order to turn, you know, the, the source elements into fuels um, and what those fuels are. And over here, you'll see the emissions impact versus uh, a low sulfur fuel oil. There are, of course, key areas of challenge. I'm not going to go through all this in detail. Um, you'll be able to read through this, but it talks about the challenges with each of these fuel types. Um, both in terms of the uh, you know the opportunity uh, and the, the part they play in, in fixing the problem, but also that they bring their own set of problems as well. And what are the ways in which those problems can be addressed or tackled? Uh, what you've got on the bottom right here is the potential um, globally for countries to produce hydrogen, um, because this is really critical. Um, hydrogen would be key to um, achieving net zero. Uh, for the shipping industry, but probably more broader than that for, for, for the globe in general. And then on this one here, this is a heat map demonstrating where the main areas of activity are from a shipping perspective uh, and a bunkering and a fuels perspective to give a flavor for where do you need the infrastructure in order to support the existing shipping industry, the movement of vessels. So you can see it's a very broad footprint. You do see concentrations in the obvious places. Um, but you can see that pretty much most parts of the globe are going to have to have some form of infrastructure to support the deployment of these fuels over here. So a very complicated picture. We're going to require a lot of infrastructure investment, a lot of change to the petrochemical industry and the fuels industry. So, and it has to happen at pace. And then finally, it's a, a, another view in terms of the uh, this transition. So ships in operation today, and to give a flavor for what they're what they're using so you know you can see the world's fleet is still using conventional fuels um, and then getting the tra and, and the transition to some of these newer fuels and you can see the percentages here they're still very low so the pace of this change is crucial and, and this table and graph here is showing how that transition is going to happen so going on the left hand side from a hydrocarbon dominated um, infrastructure and fuel type through to this mixture on the right hand side by 2050, which is a mixture of all these ones up here. Um, and you can see the critical decade is probably 2030 to 2040, uh, because not much is happening up to then. And that's mainly because the legislation is not going to kick in. And other the legislation drives it, it's likely the industry won't act at pace. So this is really the key critical period around the ability to get to a net zero solution in 2050 because the typical life cycle for vessels is around 15 years so normally a vessel that's 15 years old is becoming you know too inefficient too old uh, normally what will happen then is a, a company will be looking to renew its fleet because in the modernization you know you're getting a, um, a solution to you know having a more fuel efficient vessel it's also got efficiencies around cargo handling crewing options they are exploring um remotely operated vessels as well. So all of these technologies in order for them to land are going to be required to happen on new vessels. So that's all part of the transition as well. So hopefully you found that interesting. Um, there was a lot to get through. Uh, the slides will be shared. Hopefully you get the opportunity to um, study some of this if it's of interest to you in a bit more detail. Um, and it was a pleasure to get the chance to talk to you this evening.
Um, thank you very much, David. That was a really interesting talk. Um, much of that material was new to me, being a civil engineer. Um, I found it really, really interesting, and thank you again. There's a couple of questions in. Um, the I'm going to ask the first one because it might be the only opportunity I get. Uh, so we've heard a lot in the news this week about Ireland's energy security and the possible options around LNG storage. Just how practical is this and what does it mean for our plans to transition to renewable sources and remove our resilience on gas? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really important topic at the moment and, and, and one I think that we're going to hear a lot more about. I think the, the war, um, Ukraine-Russia war has kind of driven this to probably a, a point where it was going to get to in terms of interdependency on, on Russian gas. Um, across Western Europe. Um, we generate a lot of power from using natural gas um, and we've moved away from coal and oil to natural gas because it's been a, a cleaner fuel but also more readily available fuel. Now that dependency is becoming an issue. Um, uh, the pace in, at which we've changed over to renewable, renewables in Ireland has been quite slow. Uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't done it at the pace that they've done it in other countries. When you look at our offshore wind, um, infrastructure compared to what you'd see in the North Sea or uh, in the Baltic. It's, it's it's very, very different. So we do need to address this. And, you know, we're not going to be able to address it quickly. These are big infrastructure projects that, that won't happen overnight. The talk around LNG and storing LNG and is, is important because the current gas field has a finite life and it runs out. We're going to be dependent on a gas that comes here through pipelines from other sources, be it Norway or elsewhere. Most other countries that are facing this dilemma are looking at LNG storage and building LNG infrastructure to do that, bringing in Qatari gas, bringing in American gas. Um, you can build onshore infrastructure to do that, or you can use FRS, FSRUs to do it, which are floating uh, storage and regasification units, which in essence are a floating version of what you might have on land. But the advantage of that is it's a temporary solution. You can move it away when it's not needed. So it's a very relevant question. I think something we need to address. We can't bury our heads in the sand on this one, unfortunately. Okay, there's another question there. Uh, it's from John Cunningham, uh, a colleague of mine on the committee. Are there similar concerns on the availability of engine lubricants going forward? And are there efforts underway to move away from hydrocarbons in this space? That's a really interesting question, actually. So I think in terms of availability, um, the answer is no, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, the biggest risk to availability these days are all the global disruptors that we see impacting everything else. So the ability to have the right products in the right place is, is a real challenge for the industry I work in these days not necessarily linked to the availability of raw materials, but that infrastructure is creaking and groaning um, as well. So it's a big factor. The types of lubricants needed to, to for these engines is going to change and that transition is already happening. So there's a lot of things are going to change in the lubrication um, industry around these engines. I mean, ultimately these engines will still require lubrication unlike electric vehicles. So there will still be a requirement. And one of the key differentiators between a two-stroke and a four-stroke engine is that a two-stroke engine is burning the lubricant. So a large two-stroke engine is probably consuming anything between 100 and 300 litres of, of, of engine oil a day through the combustion process. Yeah. Okay, um, there's one or two others coming in. Um, this question is from Gareth Cleary. Uh, which of the alternative fuels shows the best promise, e.g. is it ammonia and hydrogen? And why is hydrogen not suitable for long distance shipping? That was one I was going to ask as well. Well done, Gareth, and beating me to it. Yeah, um, two good questions. Um, I think the answer to the first one, the jury is still out. Uh, the bets are on ammonia and methanol in the short term as being the, the best solutions to replace um, hydrocarbons. Uh, the longer term best bet is around hydrogen in the most available and easily produced and cost effective form, which is probably green hydrogen. One of the problems with hydrogen is that it's difficult to manage and handle. Um, also, you need large storage tanks. So the ability to use it on long voyages, you, you would have to do an awful lot of changes to the storage capacity on board vessels to use hydrogen. Um, if you think of airships, 
uh, as a good example. And you think about how much hydrogen is in an airship. You know, you can imagine trying to move a vessel with hydrogen. So that's why you, you don't. It, it's the case of scalability. You can make it into a liquid form, but then you've got to introduce, you know, a lot of energy around reducing the temperature and you know, getting down to extremely low temperatures. So challenges in that regard. Okay, we've another one or two. Um, this one's from Ndabusi MOK. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And apologies if I haven't. So the question is, transition period on the use of alternative fuels could be very long. Also, the storage requirement of these alternative fuels could be challenging. Are there any movements in industry in that regard, or are they preparing in any way? Um. The answer is yes, but the question is, is the pace sufficient to deal with the challenge? And I think that's where the dilemma lies. So when I talked earlier uh, in, the, in the presentation, I, talk, I talked about the jigsaw of, of legislation and, and governments and international bodies that all need to come to a common consensus about how all this fits together. The challenge is getting all those bodies to agree. And I think we can all see from COP26, you can sit everyone down in a room, but trying to get everyone to come to a consensus around what is the pace at which you get to a, a net zero future is extremely difficult. And different countries and different economies have different views on this because they're facing their own pressures for different reasons. So I think the pace at which shipping is going to make that transition would be very much driven by the legislation because unfortunately, a lot of people would sit back unless they have to do it and it's a compliance issue. Okay. Um, there's one more question here from Ken Rooney. With the, re with the reduced reliance on petrochemicals over time, how will hydrocarbons for polymers, etc., be produced? Medical polymers are very important, for example. Yeah, it's a really good point, Ken, because, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about uh, hydrocarbons, they just think about the hydrocarbons we use as fuels, but actually hydrocarbons are used in an awful lot of other things, like the areas you've referenced, and we have a massive dependency on plastics. Uh, and that has another whole set of challenges as well, but ultimately, when you look around uh, in our use of plastics, both as a, as a packaging material, but also as a building material, and, uh, and, and used in many other ways, we're going to have to find alternative ways to replace that. And at the moment, there are no obvious alternatives. There are synthetic options and you can make synthetic hydrocarbons, but likewise, you need the raw materials to do that. You also need the energy to do it. So they're not simple solutions. So that one is, a, is a, the jury is out on that one. Okay, um, thank you for that, David. Another one has just come in from Quadratala Afghan. Again, apologies if I haven't pronounced that correctly. Uh, the question is as follows. Do you expect the two big world major powers, China and US, to obey this carbon reduction conversions if there is a danger of one being overtaken by the other? As obviously some of these replacements to hydrocarbons are not economical. Well, that's a big that's a big question because it gets into the realms of geopolitics and the pace at which those countries are willing to adapt. So the US had been slow up to recently, but it seems to have accelerated its, its willingness to transition to uh, more environmentally friendly um, fuels and to get to net zero. China actually has been doing it at a pace that's been faster than others. So China's production of solar energy, wind energy is, has been growing at a pace and at a scale that's bigger than everywhere else. But a lot of what you hear is around the coal uh, production and energy production linked to that. So I think it's striking a balance. I think the Chinese have adapted very fast, but the thing is they're still having to produce vast amounts of energy to support their population and, and what, what the expectation is. And then of course, one of the big dilemmas of this question is that parts of the world see the West, uh, let's call it that, preaching to them about um, climate change when they're still on a journey where they're trying to get to, you know, what they see as fully developed economies. And so they see this as impinging on their ability to get to that point. So lots of challenges around the pace at which everyone does this together, because ultimately, as we all see in the news and we see it now every day, we all have to do it at the same pace, regardless of size. So the argument of saying, well, we don't make much of a contribution, so we shouldn't do anything doesn't really sit, because if everyone takes that attitude, nothing will happen. So Ireland has a role to play like everyone else, 
So, but China and the US are going to be the key drivers, as will India um, as well. Okay. Um, that's all of the questions tackled. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank David for his really interesting presentation. Um, I found it fascinating from start to end because basically I'm a civil engineer and I'm not a chemist and I'm not a mechanical engineer and I really found it interesting. <laughs>